would like to thank um, uh, all for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm particularly happy to see Professor Kamali again. Um, we've been uh, longtime friends. When you get to my age, you don't say we've been old friends, just we've been longtime friends. Um, and I'm talking about a topic that I think is very important today. Islamophobia has grown exponentially. And indeed, it was noted in, many, in a number of studies in 2015. And we continue, obviously, to see it both in the United States and American, uh, sorry, United States and European elections and within the societies. The growth of Islamophobia exponentially has been influenced by a media negativity which also reached an all-time high. In 2015, the Public Religion Research Institute uh, issued a report saying no other group in the United States uh, was subject uh, to uh, bias and discrimination as uh, were Muslims. First of all, what are the roots of Islamophobia today, contemporary uh, situation? The roots go back to actually the Iranian Revolution. Before the Iranian Revolution, Islam was invisible in terms of American and European media and even in our societies. Now, that didn't mean that Muslims weren't in America and Europe, but in fact, they were just seen as residents, perhaps foreigners, or defined uh, in terms of their nationality or ethnicity, so so-and-so is an Egyptian, so-and-so is a Malaysian. With the Iranian Revolution, you had for the first time a major engagement by majorities of populations in America and Europe because of the globalization of communications. That is that you could see on television, often live, reports coming from Iran. It caught the, the image of the West uh, and, and was seen as uh, a subject of fear because here you had the Shah of Iran with the second best military in the Middle East, second to Israel, with major Western allies, with incredible oil wealth, oil wealth, seen as a very modernizing Shah and getting a lot of TV coverage when the Shah and his wife would come to the United States, and I'm sure the same thing was true in Europe, they'd be on the major TV shows. Only six or nine months before the overthrow of the Shah, um, President Carter had toasted the Shah uh, and, and Iran as an island of stability in the Middle East. And so suddenly you had this revolution, and you picture the picture of the Shah of Iran, and next to it is a picture of Khomeini, a 77-year-old, white-bearded Ayatollah, who had been in exile for more than 20 years and was living in a suburb in Paris. It was inconceivable that this could take place. And the only violence that occurred was violence coming from the government. In other words, you had a popular revolution in which the Shah was brought down without the revolutionaries engaging in any significant violence. That success caused a ripple across the Muslim world among Sunni and Shia, and certainly in America and Europe. Khomeini called for uprisings in the Gulf, and so you in fact had uprisings in Saudi Arabia, in the Shia areas, which are the oil fields, and in Gulf countries. And the concern then became for some that with the end of the Cold War with the Soviet Union, Islam would be the next global threat. I remember that period of time because after the first Gulf War, I had even more of a concern that 
this image of Islam now as this major political force, not just a religious force, spreading across the world. And remember that for many people in the West, they knew very little about Islam. Now, let me preface what I'm going to say by the fact that my experience in the Muslim world is, over the years, many people in the Muslim world don't know very much about Christianity and Christians. So it's very comparable. But to give you an idea of the situation in the US, during the Iranian Revolution, we would have reports in the morning live on television from Tehran. So the, the host in New York, who had a popular morning show, Tom Brokaw, interrupted his comments to say, let me tell you something briefly about Islam. Islam is the second largest religion. It's globally in the world. Uh, it has a prophet, Prophet Muhammad, and uh, it has a scripture, the Quran. That's how little he presumed his audience would know, that he would start with that. And then you had a scene where the reporter then, who would be at the gate of the embassy, and the, he was going to give a report, and Americans were concerned every day about what was happening. And it's important to know that the theme for what was happening was America held hostage. Not just Americans held hostage or American diplomats. It was America held hostage, which also became the theme for a major news show on the area. Well, the reporter went up to the gate, and Maryam, the spokesperson, began with Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. She had a, a, recited a verse from the Quran, and he sort of interrupted her at a certain point uh, and said, in effect, what he was trying to say is, can we just get to your report? Because he, he had no sense this, of what this meant, to hear all these religious words. What does that mean? What we want to know is, you know, what's happening? Are, are they safe? What's going on? In any case, after the Iranian Revolution, Islam came to be seen in many ways when you began to look at what some intellectuals were saying, uh, what uh, some terrorism experts were saying, of what media was saying as a triple threat, a historical threat, i.e. Islam and Christianity throughout history, and Islam, quote, was a threat. Of course, from a Muslim point of view, Christianity was a threat. A political threat, again, we can go back in history, and then a demographic threat, a population threat. In other words, the presence of Muslims in Europe and America, and that they would grow and be a significant portion of the population. And a concern about that. Now, it was interesting, just the idea of the growth of population was seen as a concern. At that point, nobody was talking about the fact or raising the question whether or not Muslims, because they were Muslim, would be terrorists versus just that there are some Muslim extremists and terrorists. Of course, then you had what was referred to by Professor Kamali as Samuel Huntington's clash of civilizations. I happened to be there uh, when it was first kind of declared. Um, and in fact, he and I did uh, a, a so-called debate, a conference in Saudi Arabia on the clash of civilizations uh, and, and in other places. Huntington, in the 1990s, introduced this clash of civilizations. What many people miss, and here I'll sound like an academic, was that in 1981, let me ask you, how many of you, would you raise your hand if you know the name Edward Said? Not bad. Now I'll ask you how many of you knew my name. Okay, now let's get back to Edward Said. Uh, well, anyway, Edward wrote 10 years before he wrote in his book, Covering Islam, about the fact, he said, there's something that exists today and, and people have a, a, increasingly in the West have a problem with. And that is, he talked about, ultimately, the presence of the notion of a clash of civilization between Islam and the West. 10 years before Huntington. But Huntington's <coughs> book, not only the article, but the book was the one that got tremendous attention. And there's a phrase in Huntington's Clash of Civilizations which is especially prob problematic. That is, he said, Islam has bloody borders. He did not say Muslim countries have bloody borders. Islam has but bloody borders. 
Ironically, President Trump, when running for office, said, Islam hates us. A variation on the same approach. When questioned, well, do you mean some Muslim extremists, etc.? He said, oh, there are lots of them, lots of them. And he didn't back away from the phrase Islam. When, when Huntington's book came out, he and I did a telev television show, and he was asked by the moderator myself, how come you left in that phrase, Islam you know, has bloody borders? And he didn't answer it. So I think that also indirectly began to feed this notion that it was something about Islam itself. And of course, that's what contemporary Islamophobes will say. Basically, they will say, uh, yes, there are Muslim extremists and terrorists, but in fact, as, as, as one group, ACT for America, says, um, if somebody's a devout Muslim, potentially they could be a terrorist. In other words, there's something about their religion itself that can be a problem. But in America, the notion of Islamophobia wasn't discussed at all in the late 19th, uh, uh, late, uh, 19th and early 20th century. In Britain, it had occurred. In the 1990s, a British commission that looked at racism, it was simply looking at racism in Britain. One of its major conclusions was that bias and discrimination towards Muslims had reached a certain kind of level and racism that it used the word Islamophobia for the first time. Meaning, a phobia is when somebody has a fear, but often it's an unfounded fear, or it's an exaggerated fear. So that's, they came up with Islamophobia. It wasn't until 2010 in the United States when for the first time major media and that was Time Magazine had a cover asking the question, is Islam, uh, are Muslim, I'm sorry, are Americans Islamophobic? Are Americans Islamophobic? I had written about it in a book that I call The Islamic Threat, Myth, or Reality in the 90s, and I was able to cite some media in, in, in Britain and in Europe and France, as well as America, but most people weren't even aware of these kinds of articles raising those questions. 2010 in America, put it on the map. I did some interviews with CNN, and during the break, the reporters would, would ask, and the producer, what is this? And, and I said at the time, I remember, it's the tip of an iceberg. What you're seeing now is the tip of an iceberg, and we haven't even been aware that this kind of social cancer, which is what I would call it, uh, exists in our society. And you remember what 2010 was about the building of an Islamic center in New York, which came to be called the mosque at Ground Zero. It wasn't a mosque, it was an Islamic center with a prayer room, but also much of it would be for social purposes and commercial purposes. But it was called the mosque at Ground Zero, and even though it was approved within the city and within New York, all of a sudden outsiders came in, Particularly, I would see a significant Islamophobic authors and actors like Pamela Geller and others, and they mobilized people from outside to come in and demonstrate, get media attention not only in New York but globally against the building of this so-called mosque at Ground Zero, basically saying that, in effect, it was an insult given 9-11 and that it was a symbol of these activities. The result of this and that kind of thinking was that during 2010 and right after it, across the United States, you had problems with regard to the building of mosques, you know, an, an increase, as well as attacks on mosques and at times on, uh, on Muslims. So at that point, one begins to see the emphasis. Now the question is, what have been the major influences? There are several. Clearly one of the most significant is media itself. Mass media and social media. Let me give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So 
suppose you know nothing about a religion, let's say about Catholicism, and you've never met um, an Italian and an Italian Catholic. The only person you know is me. Your image may be that, well, first of all, Italians speak with their hands, and people will always say that. And secondly, you may have a certain belief about Catholics that's simply based on me, if I'm the only person you meet. You know, if I drink a lot, you may say, ah, oh, well, Catholics drink a lot. Or they, you know, they do X or Y. I remember having a colleague who was a secular Turk, and she, ha she had another colleague who we were teaching with, a Pakistani, who was very sophisticated. His shirts were made in Europe. He spoke with a slight British accent. And I remember she said, I wish all Muslims were like this man. She went by his dress, the fact that he had a good collection of classical music, etc. She thought all Pakistanis were that way. Or I remember having a woman come from India. She was educated in the West, wore, wore a sari. She was a beautiful woman, very articulate. And I had to tell the class, she's important to listen to, but this is not the average person that you're going to see if you were to go to India, or necessarily with the, the, the average ideas. For Americans who really had no major in, in, uh, uh, interaction with Muslims, and many Americans said into the 1980s and even some today that they really don't know a Muslim, and they don't know much about Islam, there was mass media. Now I'm going to give you two examples from, uh, from mass media. There's an organization called Media Tenor, T-E-N-O-R, and you can find on its website these uh, ex examples. They study media every day in Europe and America. So they did a study of 2001, 9-11 period, 2001, I'm sorry, 2001 to 2011, okay? 2001 to 2011, they looked at 975,000 pieces of media. 975,000 pieces of media in Europe and America. And they looked and said, where is Islam and Muslims? How much coverage? 2001, they saw 2% of the coverage was on Muslim terrorists and extremists, 0.1% on Muslims and Islam, mainstream Muslims and Islam. So. You got 2% on extremists, 0.1%, barely any coverage on the context. Who are the vast majority of Muslims? What are they like? 2015, Media Tenor did another study, and what did they discover? Eight out of 10 stories, eight out of 10 were negative. Even the stories on, if you will, mainstream Islam some of them tended to be a bit negative. And when personalities were featured, they usually were warriors and terrorists. But more important than mass media is social media in the last 10 years. Social media. We and others, we meaning my center uh, and others, talk about an organized Islamophobic network. So what we really say is that there are individuals and groups and organizations, not all, who are interconnected. So you may see one website, but in fact, there's a connection to this other website. They may share stories or both print the story, or from one think tank will write for the other think tank. So an organized Islamophobic network. It's a kind of cottage industry that has grown tremendously. Why? Not just the issues, but why were they able to grow so fast? Because they are significantly funded. Let me give you an idea. Two major studies were done. One by the Center for American Progress, which looked at a 10-year period and looked at seven major philanthropic organizations, major organizations that give money for a variety of things. It could be for hospitals, it could be for education, but also seven that gave money 
to individuals and organizations that engaged in anti-Islam and anti-Muslim rhetoric, bias, actions, policies, etc. And they found that $42.5 million had been given by these organizations. Whether or not they fully knew who they were giving it to is beside the point. And this was based on IRS returns. In other words, income tax documents. So there's an objectivity to that. You've got the income tax, income tax documents that have to be filed by these organizations or individuals, and you can see the money that went to it. But CARE, a major Muslim organization, did a study and looked at several years intensively and found that more than $205 million had gone to these individuals. Now, think about that in terms of impact. Imagine if this institute, or if a group of institutes here had $205 million. How do you counter that? Where throughout the world, whether it's in the Muslim world in the West, even among those who actually do the work of talking about what Islam is, talking about religious pluralism, etc., where do we see any kind of funding of those resources? Mm -hmm. Another major influence, and a major influence, mm -hmm. has been elections. In terms of America, it would be American elections. If you look at American elections, starting particularly in 2008 with the election of Barack Obama, one sees a strong emergence. You remember what Barack Obama, because his name sounded Muslim, the negative thing would be that in fact he was a Muslim. Uh, uh, Trump, Donald Trump, now President Trump, said for years that he, even, even when the document was produced, it was still the so, birth issue, supposedly. You, may, you won't remember that during the elections, uh, uh, the primaries, d when uh, Obama was eventually elected, during the primaries, the whole question and issue of Islam and Muslims came up in terms of the candidates and what they had to say about Islam and Muslims. And therefore, by extension, the idea that Obama might be a Muslim. I used to say, when Obama left office, that my one wish would be that Obama would go on national television, given all the rumors, and when one of the comedians at night on his show would say, so what's it like to be retired? He would begin his comments with, Bismillahi rahman rahim You would have just seen the whole place explode, okay? So, it came up during Obama's elections. You will note that during Obama's presidency, he never went to a mosque until his last year in office, the eighth year, because it was seen as very sensitive. He wasn't seen being photographed, you know, with, with uh, people, uh, uh, Arabs and Muslims, if they were dressed, you know, and quote, Islamically. He went to Cairo. He went to Jakarta. He went to Istanbul. I saw him in Istanbul when he was, uh, was visiting there, but it did not happen in America. So that sensitivity to that issue. Now you move to our last elections, and it stands out even more strongly. When you look at the Republican candidates in the debate, you had a president say, Islam hates us, and it's lots and lots of them, and we don't know, and maybe we need to uh, uh, monitor mosques or monitor Muslims, and then eventually it became you know, a notion of a Muslim ban. You had other candidates running, with one candidate saying that for a Muslim to run for the presidency, and another saying even in his cabinet, they would have to either deny Islam or deny that they practice Sharia. Uh, you began to see, even before those elections, people like Newt Gingrich warning. When Newt Gingrich ran, uh, 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 when Obama was running, Gingrich suddenly started talking about Sharia and whether or not Sharia uh, w would become federal law. There were no Muslims talking about Sharia. There were no Muslim organizations talking about Sharia. There was almost nobody talking about Sharia. 
and yet Gingrich began that wave, and that became, occurred then. Uh, it was then picked up by Rick Santorum, who was a candidate, including in the last elections, uh, another member of Congress, etc. In fact, in the last elections, Newt Gingrich said, Muslims should be asked if they practice Sharia, and if they say yes, they should be deported. So you can see how the presidential elections bring it out and bring out the fear. I mean, think about the kind of media coverage that's getting. So you've got the Islamophobic uh, websites and authors and books. Many times in the past, if you went to Amazon, you would see that among the top sellers would be Islamophobic books with negative kinds of titles, etc. let alone when you have elections and you have this kind of argument. So instead of talking about the fact that we have all of these Muslim citizens, and then you've got these Muslims, some distinguishing them from Muslim extremists, in fact, Islam becomes the issue, and being a Muslim becomes the issue. I can remember uh, after 9-11 being on a plane, and a woman heard what I do, and said, leaned over and said to me, so how many embedded cells do you think there are? At that point, I didn't have a clue what she was talking about. This language was just, it was embedded cells, you know. So how, how many mosques, you see, are embedded cells, you know, with, with, with members of the, of the, of, of the mosque uh, being uh, radicals? Or as some people would have put it, wolves in sheep's clothing. You see, that's what you have to, you know, worry about or be careful about. It is then within, within that context that we then are dealing with where we are today. If you look at the elections in Europe, if you look at the recent elections in Hungary, and I think also in Czechoslovakia, and if you also look at the Polish government, while they don't have many Muslims, Islamophobia is strong. I, I did a conference in Europe a couple of years ago, and we were talking about um, Islamophobia in Europe and America, and a woman got up, a scholar from Poland, um, and said, kind of like, the good news is there aren't many Muslims, so there shouldn't be a problem. The bad news is Poland is very Islamophobic. That is the government, the politics of, uh, of Poland. Uh, and it, it sort of dovetails with recently the government, the leadership, showing that they're also anti-Semitic. If you look at the elections in the Netherlands, the elections in France, uh, you look at the, the politics in Germany, you can see the problem. Now, the funny thing about it is that some of us will say, ah, but thank God in France and in the UK um, and in the Netherlands, uh, the anti-Muslim people did not win or come in first. But the point is they came in second. Second is strong, and if, if, if the situation changes in the country, the politics can easily swing. You've got established parties that exist, not just an individual comes, loses, and is discredited. But where does the threat really come from in America and Europe? The threat actually comes from the growth of far-right, white, nationalist organizations populist movements. We see it in the US, we certainly see it in the UK, etc. Uh, these, are, these are movements that basically see foreigners, immigrants, okay, let alone Muslims, as a threat to what they see as, if you will, the motherland. And the motherland is what? The motherland is going back in our history, whether it's Europe or America, we are, you know, we've been a, a, a country of white people, often that speak one language, you know, in other words, in, in, in Europe, you know, Denmark, everybody spoke Danish, Sweden, everybody, okay, and everybody was born into the same uh, religion, and if you will, culture and civilization. And so suddenly you've got this browning of the country by other groups of people, immigrants in general, but very much also part of that, uh, Muslims. And it's not surprising then that in those countries you have instances of not just language that is threatening and a warning that Muslims are growing very fast and their, their population will over, overrun us, 
In Britain, they used to talk about Britain is going to become Lundistan, <laughs> you know, to try to emphasize that kind of threat. But what is the reality on the ground? The reality on the ground is, just to give you one or two examples from history, if we look at the period from 9-11 to 2014, that's 13, almost 14 years, there were 20 plots, 20 plots by Muslim militants, killing a max of 50 people. At the same time, right-wing extremists were involved in 337 attacks, 337 attacks, killing 250. Four people. More recently, two years ago, the FBI came out with a report saying that the number one threat domestically to America were white anti-government organizations and groups. White anti-government organizations and groups. A group called the Southern Poverty Law Center and if you're interested in, I would go to their website. Southern Poverty Law Center tracks this issue constantly and speaks out on organizations and groups. The SPLC has been saying that for several years, that the real threat we need to be concerned about. How do we see that playing out after the election, this recent elections in America? In 2016, there were 917 of these extremist groups, anti, you know, uh, white anti-government groups, 917. That had grown from 892. On the other hand, when you look at anti-Muslim groups, 2015 there were 34, 2017, 101. Almost tripled, almost immediately tripled. We see then the Muslim ban representing an attitude. That is a, a blind approach to put in a Muslim ban that will impact not just ordinary immigration from Muslim countries, but basically will put, shut the door down uh, or very heavily monitor immigrants who are fleeing from Syria and other areas that, in fact, we in the West see as a persecuted people who had to leave their countries, you know, Syria's Assad and the problems of Iraq and other places, but put in that ban. And in fact, the heart of the Muslim ban cited several countries, I think it was five and then moved to seven, and somebody wrote an article and said that throughout the years, nobody from those countries had engaged in any act of terrorism. Despite that, we see the movement going on. Is there light at the end of the tunnel? I don't know. I know that one of the things that is, brings some hope is that when the Muslim ban was put into effect, or when they, initially when they thought it would be into effect, and our courts have been of preventing that, but the administration is still pushing to put that through. Uh, when that occurred, that very day, you had Americans of all kinds of backgrounds going to airports. People of all colors, different religions, people who didn't care about religion, NGO organizations. It did set off in America a notion among NGOs, for example, Black Lives Matter, and other groups that we in America have to respond to this kind of activity because it's a threat to our society, to our democracy, to our notion of civil liberties. It flies in the face of that, to our notion of freedom of religion, to our notion that we are a country of immigrants, captured by the, the phrase uh, attributed um, uh, to the, uh, oh, it's the statue of the woman welcoming, yeah, what, what that, I can't even think of, the Statue of Liberty, yeah. I've got jet lag, Statue of Liberty, you know, you know, basically give us your, you know, you're hungry, you're tired, and you're poor, 
that's a positive, but we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go because almost everything I've said, it gives us a matter of concern. If you look at the administration of President Trump, the man he appointed initially to be the head of the National Security Council, General Flynn, had a track record of being anti-Muslim, of being featured and celebrated, and I think receiving an award from a group called Act for America, which is probably the, the largest anti-Muslim group in America. If you look at the current Secretary of State, Mr. Pompeo, has a similar record of being associated and celebrated by ACT, also an organization uh, uh, run by a man named Frank Gaffney um, uh, that, that has a, a Center for Security, but emphasizes a very strong, if you go and, and look that up on the internet, you'll see statements that he makes which defy logic. I mean, statements that are made simply uh, inaccurately about the threat to America from Islam and Muslims. The Attorney General, Mr. Sessions, has a similar record. And some of the advisors that uh, uh, President Trump has. And again, if you look at Europe, it's not just the far right movements and their issues, it's the fact that that's affected the mainstream parties as well. I remember when Tony Blair stepped down in the UK, he had his last big conference. And at that conference, both Brown, who succeeded, and then the next fellow who was succeeded Brown, both of them got up and talked about British policy and the future. And both of them had the mentality, and one of them actually used the word that Muslims had to be in Britain, had to be more grateful and active with regard to their host country. When you say host country, it implies that even though you're a citizen, you're a foreigner. And I remember after it, a young man who actually was in the British foreign office who had been brought in, young man, a Muslim who was a bit of an expert, was livid because I think his family came uh, to Britain at the end of the 19th century. And other people felt that way. So we've got a long way to go. If you want to get a sense of the threat of Islamophobia and see statistics on it, stories about it, also material about you know who are the terrorists, who aren't, what what are the average American and European Muslims really about, you know who are they, what kinds of stories featuring it, go to bridge, bridge .georgetown.edu. This is an organization that I've created within our Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. It's called The Bridge, Protecting Pluralism, American Pluralism, by Ending Islamophobia, because Islamophobia is a threat to that pluralism. We've set that uh, website up, set that organization up about two years ago. We have more than a million followers on Facebook, and you'll find all kinds of materials or accuracy. When people say, why don't Muslims speak out? We've got statements about that. What do Muslims believe about this? You know, what, what, we have a fact sheet section, fact sheets. We do a fact sheet on people that we see as a problem. So we have fact sheets on, for example, American politicians. We have fact sheets on uh, uh, Trump and his attitudes towards Islam, members of the cabinet, members of his advisory. On, we have fact sheets on those organizations and institutes that engage in this. It is our job, and this is always the way in which speakers like to finish, but it's true today. You know, unlike when I first began to talk about Islam and Muslims, most people didn't know about it. And when I came out here, there didn't seem to be much to talk about. I mean, people were glad that I knew something about Islam and Muslims, but it wasn't a big issue, or some people didn't have to worry about it. I now say every citizen globally has to. Because in a globalized world, we are interdependent whether we like it or not, politically, economically, culturally. I happened to have a BBC on last night, and they were talking about the problem of Indonesia um, with plastic and plastic bottles. And they showed how there's so much plastic there that in some villages, it's, it's a sea of plastic on top of the water. And that it's, it, they move it from one area to another area of Indonesia, but the fact is, the extent if that's not 
cleaned up, it will spread around the world, just as global warming spreads around the world. Well, the same thing's true when we talk about terrorism. There is an issue of global terrorism. I mean, the fact is, Muslim extremists, and there are other kinds of extremists, but if we're talking about Muslim extremists, the vast majority of victims are not Westerners, but in fact are Muslims in Muslim societies. So that issue is there, and we need to pay attention to it, and it impacts our cultures and our societies economically across the board. It is your job, not Professor Kamali and I. We're entitled at this stage of our life to just enjoy it. For you, you're still out there. You're going to have families. You're going to get educated. You're going to vote. And you ought to be concerned about who you vote for in your society vis-a-vis -vis the policies both at home and abroad, and very concerned about global politics. No longer can we live in a globalized world with people not knowing about the religions of the world and the cultures of the world, because we are globalized, and the influences are there whether we like it or not. And with the younger generation especially, one of the examples I give in America is you know, if, if they're far right, you want to have nothing to do with immigrants, you want to have nothing to do with other people's religions. The fact is, if you go to school in America, university, primary school, etc., we're more and more multi-ethnic and multicultural. Whether people want to see it as a threat or not, the same thing's true in Europe. You'd have to find a very special school and pay an awful lot of money to find a special school that was simply racist and your kind of place. And so as we look at our own societies, that's more and more going to be the case. So I'm glad many of you came. And if you have any questions, we can move on to a, a Q&A. But otherwise, thank you very much for listening and for this invitation.